In this video, I want to go through an example of applied Bayesian inference, and the example we're going to be talking about is disease prevalence within a population. So we suppose that we've got some population, and within that population, there is a certain fraction of people who actually have this particular disease, and the parameter which governs this probability is what we call theta. And we only have a sample from that population, we have a sample of data, and what we'd like to know is, given that we have this sort of sample here, what sort of posterior distribution can we assign to theta, so after we've seen the data. And what I'm going to assume here is that essentially we've got a sample of, to begin with, 10 people, and out of those 10 people we find that only one of them has the disease. So perhaps you can sort of see here that the appropriate model to use for the likelihood of this data, the probability of the data, which in this case is just x given our sort of parameter theta, you might think that perhaps the best sort of uh, thing to use here would be the binomial distribution. So what we could have here is we'd have 10, 1, in this standing for the sort of NCR notation, times theta to the power, in this case, well, it's just theta to the power 1, times 1 minus theta to the power, or n minus 1, which is just going to be 9 here. So that's our likelihood in this particular example. We also need to pick a prior density in order to derive the posterior. So what could our prior be? Well, let's assume that we don't really have any sort of idea as to whether the disease occupies sort of 100% or 0% in the population. So what we're actually going to give here is a uniform distribution. But instead of just specifying it as a uniform distribution, we're going to specify it in terms of a beta distribution. Because remember that a beta 1, 1 distribution is exactly the same thing as a uniform distribution on 0, 1. And what we'd like to know is what does the posterior look like here? So what is the probability of theta given that we've received our data x? And we know that we could do this using Bayes' formula. This is equal to the probability of data, or in this case, actually, if I keep notation the same, probability of x given theta times the probability of theta, which is our prior, all divided through by our probability of our data. And we could go through and we could work out the numerator and then integrate it to get the denominator, but we don't need to in this example because we've already proved that if we have a beta prior and we're talking about the situation where we have a binomial likelihood, that in that circumstance we can derive the posterior very quickly just using a simple rule. We know that in this example the posterior, because the beta prior is conjugate to a binomial, the posterior is also going to be a beta distribution here. And here, to work out what the posterior looks like, all we need to do is we need to take the a from our original prior distribution and add it onto x. So now we're just going to get 1 plus 1 for the first input of the beta distribution. And then for the second input, what we're going to do is we're going to take our b from our prior, add on n, and take away x. So we're going to take our b, which is 1, plus 10, and then x is 1, so we're just going to take away 1 from that. So this is just equivalent to a beta distribution which has got first argument 2 and second argument 10. And you can ask, what does that sort of distribution look like? Well, the posterior distribution, remember that the expected value of a beta distribution, so the expected value of theta, given our data in this example, we know is equal to our sort of parameters of our beta distribution, or we'll call it a, divided by a plus b. And because our new a is 10 and a plus b is, is 12 in this example, we know that our mean of our distribution, if I sort of write it down here, would be 2 over 12, which is 1 sixth. So you might expect our distribution to be peaked somewhere relatively near to that. It's not going to be exactly that because that's the mode, but it's not going to be far off that. So our distribution is going to look something perhaps like this blue line which I'm drawing here. So it's going to be very strongly peaked to the left of the 0 0.5 marker, even though the fact that we have specified a completely uniform prior to begin with. But I don't want you to take my word for it. I've actually coded this up in MATLAB, and this allows us to sort of run simulations uh, exactly as I've just said here. So what we're doing here is we're starting off with A and B being 1, and we're starting off with a sample of 10 from which one individual in that sample has the disease. So let's run this. And we see here that what I've done here is I've coded up the sort of prior here. So the prior is just a uniform distribution. Then we've got the likelihood in MOVE here, and then finally the posterior. And 
the reason I've actually done it in this sort of vertical form here is because we can sort of see that because we know that the posterior is proportional to the prior times the likelihood, and because the prior is flat here, the posterior exactly mirrors what's going on in the likelihood. But note that the likelihood isn't a valid probability distribution. This doesn't integrate to one, whereas the posterior always does. So in this particular example, we see that our distribution is peaked very near to the sort of, you know, probably about 0 0.1, 0 0.12 point in sort of theta space. What happens if we were to change our prior? Because this is a sort of common question in, uh, in sort of Bayesian inference. And let's say we were to make our prior sort of heavily focused towards a high prevalence of the disease. So I've picked A to be 8 now. If we rerun this with A being 8, we see that our prior is now very strongly peaked up towards sort of the entire population having the disease, so up towards 1. And our likelihood it still remains where it is. And hence the posterior is the sort of, sort of mixture of these two things, if you imagine multiplying them two together. And it's sort of halfway between the prior and the likelihood. So when you sort of see it like this, it seems a bit dangerous, Bayesian inference, because I've specified such an incorrect prior here that it's completely clouded all of my inference in this particular circumstance. Well, in some ways that may be correct, but what is important to notice is as I increase the amount of data, then the influence of the prior becomes less and less important. So now if I increase my amount of data to let's say 100 people in my sample and let's say that I've got 10 people that now have the disease. If I now rerun this, even though my prior has remained as it was before because I'm still maintaining that we've got this sort of ridiculous prior to begin with, you see that the posterior now is very much strongly more influenced by the likelihood than it is by the prior. And that's because if you look at the likelihood, the likelihood is much smaller for all values of theta than is the prior. It's not a proper probability density. And this becomes even more pertinent as I increase the amount of data. So now I've got 1,000 individuals in our sample. I've only got 10 individuals who've got the disease. And the sort of peaks now in likelihood are that much more pronounced. And then it's pretty much zero thereafter. So it doesn't matter that over to the right here when theta is approximately 1 uh, in our in our sort of prior density here, and we've got a PDF value of eight, that's massively dominated by the fact that the likelihood is very, very small there. So the posterior density, which is the sort of product of, or proportional to the product of these two things, very heavily focuses on the likelihood, especially when we've got a lot of data. Anyway, I don't want you to take my word for this. I've included in the description below this video this particular MATLAB program, and please feel free to go ahead and run it yourself.